Hello everyone. We all face environmental, geotechnical, and geological hazards that threaten our property and sometimes our very lives no matter where you live. Perhaps this man said it best. first moved here in my first six months. Hurricanes, floods, drought, wildfire, eastern encephalitis, shark bites, lightning strikes, tornadoes, uh, alligator attacks. I, you live in Jurassic Park. That's all there is to it. Everything in Florida wants to kill you. I thought his quote was right on the money and was in response to a giant sinkhole opening up near his home in Florida. No matter where you live, there are major hazards to contend with, whether they're natural or man-made, and they often spring without warning. In this video, I'll present an overview of the hazards of sinkholes, where they occur, how they develop, and what can be done to mitigate the risk they pose to lives and property. I think the most terrifying example of the tragedy that can strike suddenly was the development of a sinkhole in 2013 where the sinkhole opened up beneath this man's home in the middle of the night. This resulted in his entire bedroom and everything in it collapsing into the hole, which included the bed he was sleeping on. He plunged into a 100 foot deep hole. He was never seen again and shortly thereafter he was pronounced dead by local officials. Bave repaired this stinkhole by backfilling it and monitoring it multiple times and it opened up again this past summer. There are a variety of sinkhole types. In general, a sinkhole is a void that travels to the ground surface and is formed by internal erosion that involves raveling of soil into portions of the bedrock that are very porous or may contain solution cavities or voids. Think of a cave complex underground. In Florida, Sinkholes primarily form due to rainwater that becomes acidic from dissolved gases like carbon dioxide and organic elements which percolate through the cracks and joints in the rock. I built this model to show you how this works. Okay, here's my model. I've created a cutout so you can see one of the solution cavities and it has a thin layer of roof rock over the top. I have uh, in a similar fashion two other sinkholes that don't have cutouts for viewing but are internal to the, to the setup of the model. So what I'm gonna do is introduce a solution to saturate the layer of sand with uh, its water and sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, and that will cause the gypsum in the plaster of Paris to dissolve, which will simulate the effects of slightly acidic rainwater or groundwater dissolving carbonate minerals such as limestone or dolomite that are common through many parts of the United States, but in particularly Florida. And you'll see the development of the sinkhole as the roof rock dissolves and then sand is able to migrate into the open void causing a significant amount of ground settlement. I've dyed the water blue to make it easier to see. So in a similar manner to this model, and for many places in Florida and other locations, the acidic water dissolves the carbonate minerals, again typically limestone or dolomite, and it forms large voids in the bedrock layer. When the sand and clay soils that overlie the bedrock flow or ravel into the voids in the bedrock, the ground above these areas settle and create a large void at the surface. Many lakes in Florida are the result of prior sinkhole collapses to a level that's at or below the upper groundwater surface. You can typically identify these sinkhole lakes by their typically round shape, as you can see from this map from the Orlando, Florida area. About 30 years ago, I had a project in central Florida where the plan was to build a new power plant. I was in the field with the drill crew to conduct the on-site geotechnical investigation. The anticipated subsurface profile consisted of about 50 feet of dense clay sand with the limestone bedrock contact approximately 50 feet below the ground surface. So this is exactly what we saw in the first two borings. 50 feet of soil over limestone bedrock. However, I knew the power plant developer had a huge problem when the third boring only encountered loose soils to a depth of 120 feet before any limestone was encountered. It was obvious that a big portion of the site was occupied by a collapsed sinkhole that had refilled with soil deposits. The drill crew was in a near panic that we had to quickly decide, do we continue advancing the boring with coring methods or do they pull their tooling out altogether? And uh, I knew this was going to be a real budget buster continuing at these depths. However, as a general rule, you never want to end a boring in loose or soft material. And in particular, you want to 
continue the boring till you can adequately characterize the true bedrock contact elevation. Out of uh, extreme caution, we went ahead and, and pulled out of the hole and, and grouted it back up. The developer ended up having to spend millions of dollars in ground improvement measures to stabilize this zone of soil filled sinkhole that had collapsed. And this delayed the construction of the power plant by several months. I'll talk about what measures you can take to remediate a site with such features like this later in the video. Here's another example of a resort complex that fell into a sinkhole in the middle of the night. I don't know why these things tend to happen in the middle of the night. Fortunately, no one was killed, but it was a very scary situation. The fact is, such instances are only likely to increase in Florida and other states where such sinkhole development is common and I'm going to give you the reasons why that's the case. Here's a map showing the states with a significant level of sinkhole activity with the majority of sinkholes occurring in the states of Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, and Missouri. Such areas are referred to as karst topography and occur in many other countries around the world. Karst is a German term that was first used to describe an area in Slovenia. Karst topography develops not only from dissolutioning or dissolving of carbonate rocks such as limestone and dolomite, but also from dissolution of evaporite deposits. The reasons that problems associated with sinkholes are only likely to get worse in the future is due to a combination of several factors. These factors include increasing population with associated increases in urban development, and general lowering of the groundwater table such that it makes it easier for these solution features to collapse into the bedrock. Now let's talk about what kind of ground improvement measures can be used to stabilize a site where you have a sinkhole. In the case of the power plant in Florida that I mentioned earlier, Keller used a combination of several methods of ground improvement such as deep dynamic compaction, fibro compaction, and compaction grouting. I found a series of short videos from Keller's website that illustrate these technologies. This was done to increase the density of the sand in the collapsed sinkhole features to make these soils less prone to internal erosion, which would cause them to run into fractures and voids in the underlying bedrock. The deep dynamic compaction work consisted of dropping a 20 ton weight from a height of 100 feet with a crane boom that had been modified to reduce recoil after the weight was released. Here's a short clip of how this was done at a different project site. The impact locations are laid out on a grid pattern. Each location is generally impacted two or three times and later backfilled and recompacted using what's called an ironing pass that is either with a smaller weight or with a reduced drop height. Obviously not all sites are suitable for employing dynamic compaction. There could be significant ground vibrations and noise so that if you have adjacent development that's a little too close that's probably not going to be a, a very good option. You can also have instances where rock will fly out from the edges of the weight after impact. I was on a project in California where a piece of gravel shot out from underneath the weight and hit a guy's uh, femur and fractured it and he was standing about 300 feet away. Now here's a clip of vibral compaction. This tooling involves an eccentric weight that is spun at the base of the assembly and the whole probe is inserted into the target zone in the soil. Water and sometimes compressed air are jetted from the sides of the probe and then sand or gravel is introduced at the top of the hole using a front end loader typically and this material falls down the annular space between the probe and the soil. The probe is raised and lowered such that this backfill gets compacted against the native soils. Finally, here's a clip of compaction grouting. Stiff grout is injected and forms a bulb under the ground surface and is injected in a pattern to create cells with soil in between cells being pushed into a denser state from the injection pressures. In some instances, efforts are made to place a layer of cement grout at the bedrock contact to reduce the potential for soil infiltration, but this wasn't done at the power plant site because it appeared that any bedrock that could be prone to collapse had already done so thousands of years ago. So this is one aspect that's really important to assess the risk of sinkholes, and that's to figure out whether the activity was ancient, occurring thousands of years in the past, or whether such activity is likely to develop in the present and future. The other thing that has to be determined is the level of risk that's associated with the potential impacts of the formation of a new sinkhole or the enlargement of an existing sinkhole to people and adjacent property. This news story references an evaluation by geotechnical engineers of the risk associated with the redevelopment of a sinkhole after it had been remediated following the death of the Sefner man in 2013. A geotechnical engineer will be on scene today to assess the sinkhole and come up with a timetable for when they can begin remediation and stabilization. But at this point, no dates have been provided. So what can you do to investigate sinkholes or the potential for a site to develop sinkholes? Typically, such investigations could include drone or aerial surveys to look for the characteristic circular shape patterns of an existing sinkhole or one that's just about to open up. Another tool that can be used is satellite LIDAR data that can determine relatively small changes in ground surface elevation over time. You also have traditional drilling and sampling like the power plant example that I mentioned 
to determine variations in the contact elevation of the bedrock, as well as identifying variations in the consistency and type of overburdened soils. Geophysical methods can also be really useful to identify zones of dissolution bedrock. These include surface methods such as seismic refraction, seismic reflection, and electrical resistivity surveys. Now certainly other areas of the country can have sinkholes that develop related to the collapse of say underground mines that are in limestone, salt, or coal. In the urban environment, sinkholes can develop from the erosion of fine grain soil typically backfill around drainage or water supply line. This is exactly what happened recently in Japan, where the erosion around an underground storm drainage tunnel took out a large intersection in a short period of time. Impressively, the Japanese engineers and contractors were able to restore this intersection in a period of seven days. Earlier, I mentioned the development of sinkholes from salt mines. In 1980, there was a dramatic example of the rapid formation of a sinkhole that led to the drainage of an entire lake in just a few hours. This sinkhole was caused by oil exploration drilling near the lake that accidentally intersected an underground salt mine. This breach was like pulling the drain plug out of an old fashioned bathtub. Amazingly, no one was killed in this mishap, but there were men on a ship that barely escaped before the ship was dragged down in a massive underground vortex. Finally, there have been instances of sinkholes forming as a result of thawing of permafrost. Increasing temperatures not only thaw lenses of ice in the foundation soils, but they also promote a higher rate of decay of organic matter in the soils, which leads to soil settlement and often sinkholes at the ground surface. I'd be interested in what experiences you've had with sinkholes. Are you particularly concerned if you were to live in Florida about the risk of sinkholes? Even though these episodes that I've related are, are typically rare occurrences, they do happen and they do impact people's lives and properties. And I think it's the sudden nature of how these things can develop that's particularly terrifying. So please let me know your thoughts in the comments section and please stay tuned for future videos. Thanks very much.